Scientists have spent decades tracking California's coastline, expecting only slow, almost invisible changes. But just days ago, their sensors picked up a vertical rise, measured in inches, not millimeters, in locations where that should be impossible. This was not supposed to happen. As field teams scramble to verify the numbers, even the experts are asking, what force is powerful enough to lift California land so fast? And why are the warning signs only surfacing now? Before sunrise, field crews from USGS and Caltech rolled out along the California coastline, trucks loaded with precision gear. By 6.10 a.m., the first GPS base station was anchored at Transect 14B, a windswept stretch near Pacifica. Teams moved with practiced urgency, hauling tilt meters, INSAR reflectors, and solar power arrays across sand and rock. Each device had a coded tag, Transect 14B, 17C, 21A, mapped to a grid that stretched from Mendocino to Monterey. Installations were logged to the 2nd, 6.24 a.m. at Point Arena, 7.03 a.m. at Bodega Head, 7.41 a.m. at Half Moon Bay. Technicians calibrated each sensor with laser levels and checked satellite uplinks, forming a dense network capable of capturing millimeter scale changes in elevation. Alongside the GPS beacons, borehole extensometers were lowered into pre-drilled shafts, their cables trailing to weatherproof data loggers. By mid-morning, the coast bristled with new hardware, over 40 stations in less than four hours, each transmitting live feeds to a central data hub in Menlo Park. Coordination was relentless. USGS geophysicists relayed coordinates by radio. While Caltech engineers monitored signal strength and battery voltages from mobile command vans. At Santa Barbara, a fault mapping drone lifted off, tracing the sensor grid's southern edge. Meanwhile, tide gauge technicians at Long Beach aligned their instruments to the new reference points, synchronizing sea level and land motion records in real time. Every team member knew their task. Some logged serial numbers, others tightened anchor bolts or ran diagnostics on seismic nodes. The grid geometry was deliberate. Transects ran perpendicular to the shoreline at set intervals, ensuring no gap in coverage. By noon, the entire coastal array was operational, streaming continuous data on vertical motion, ground tilt, and tidal shifts. The coastline, for the first time, was under a watchful, unblinking eye. At 12.19 p.m., the first raw data streams arrived at the Menlo Park hub, flagged with a string of low-frequency tremors from offshore sensors. Spectrograms flickered with broad, slow pulses, energy signatures that did not fit the usual catalog of microquakes or ship traffic. The digital tide charts, meanwhile, displayed subtle but persistent anomalies, tide peaks arriving minutes ahead of prediction, troughs lingering longer than models allowed. Each perturbation was logged by timestamp, cross-referenced against the GPS base stations and tide gauges now blanketing the coast. In the command van, the field lead hunched over a bank of screens, tracing a faint, rhythmic oscillation buried in the background noise. The offshore probe at Transect 17C sent a data burst at 12.43 p.m., a spike in vertical acceleration, followed by a return to baseline. The event repeated at intervals, each time nudging the tide readings upward by millimeters, then centimeters. By 1.10 p.m., three separate stations had recorded similar patterns, all within a 40-kilometer stretch north of Santa Cruz. Technicians double-checked for known error sources. Tropospheric delays were ruled out by weather logs, or were orbital corrections held steady. Tidal aliasing showed no match to the observed cycles. With each cross-check, the anomaly held. The data feed from Point Arena's borehole extensometer showed a slow upward creep, barely a fraction of a millimeter per minute, but unmistakable over the course of the afternoon. The field lead called for a secure channel, relaying the latest logs to the lab for urgent review. Core sample transfer was prioritized. Every minute counted as the anomaly persisted. 
In the background, the Menlo Park team built a composite map, layering spectrograms, tide deviations, and GPS elevation changes. The coastline's behavior, for the first time, was being captured in real time, each signal adding weight to a mystery that no standard model could explain. Under the microscope, the thin sections from the Pacifica and Point Arena cores reveal a story at odds with the familiar geology of California's coast. This is an anomaly. Grains of olivine and pyroxene dominate the slides, minerals more common in the Earth's mantle than in shallow marine sediments. Their angular crystals interlock in a dense matrix, lacking the rounded edges typical of beach sand shaped by water and time. In one photomicrograph, a sharp boundary slices through layers of quartz and feldspar, the lighter minerals abruptly giving way to a dark, glassy zone studded with greenish olivine. Cross-polarized light brings out a mosaic of interference colors, each hue mapping a different orientation in the crystal lattice. The prevalence of olivine pyroxene clusters, some exceeding a millimeter in diameter, stands out against the expected background of weathered silicates and carbonates. These textures suggest rapid transport from depth, not the slow accumulation of surface erosion. Tiny inclusions, minute bubbles, and metallic flecks dot the larger grains, hinting at high temperature origins. The laboratory team catalogs each anomaly, capturing high-resolution images for further analysis. The visual evidence alone raises questions about the forces at work beneath the coastline. Standard explanations, erosion, river input, and coastal upwelling cannot account for these exotic mineral assemblages. With each slide, Suspicion grows that new material is ascending from deep below, carried upward by processes not yet understood. The next step is elemental testing to determine the precise chemistry driving the anomaly. Lab benches filled with trays of core fragments as the analytical team prepared for elemental testing. Each sample was logged, weighed, and loaded into an X-ray fluorescent spectrometer the machine's detectors tuned to capture even the faintest trace of magnesium, iron, and oxygen isotopes. The first results appeared on screen. Magnesium to iron ratios from the Pacifica and Point Arena cores hovered above 7.2, a value rarely seen in coastal sediments, where typical crustal rocks register between 2 and 4. The numbers drew immediate attention. In mantle-derived materials, Ratios above 8 are common, but for surface sands, anything above 5 is an outlier. Further confirmation came from isotope analysis. The delta 18 O values, an indicator of oxygen's isotopic signature, fell between 5.4 and 6.1 per mil, tightly clustered around the range found in mantle olivine, not the higher values expected from weathered beach deposits. The lab's lead geochemist checked calibration standards and re-ran the tests. The anomaly persisted. Graphs plotted side by side showed a clear break from historical records. The Point Arena core, just meters below the surface, Nyeshkoris B. surface, matched the chemistry of rocks formed deep within the Earth. As data accumulated, the team compared the new readings against decades of archived samples. The contrast was stark. No previous collection along the California coast had displayed this combination of high magnesium to iron ratios and mantle-like delta 18 O values. The findings forced a confrontation with established geological models. If these numbers held, the source of the rising material was not erosion, not river transport, but something far deeper. An influx of mantle-sourced chemistry now quantifiable and impossible to ignore. Archived velocity plots from the past decade line up in neat columns on the monitors at Menlo Park. Each graph tells a consistent story. The California coastline, tracked by satellite and GPS, has shifted vertically at rates measured in millimeters per year, sometimes up, more often down, but always within predictable bounds. No section of coast from Mendocino to Monterey has recorded excursions greater than a centimeter 
in any single year. Now the new data streams are drawing lines that refuse to follow those patterns. Overlays reveal abrupt jumps of 15 to 20 centimeters where the historical record is flat. The divergence is not subtle. On one display, the 2025 INSAR time series for Transect 17C shows a vertical leap in just three weeks, eclipsing the gentle undulations of every prior year. Another screen flashes a warning. Outlier exceeds noise threshold. Error analysts gather, scrutinizing each step in the measurement process. They examine atmospheric corrections, satellite orbit adjustments, and instrument calibration logs. Tropospheric delay is ruled out. ERA-5 weather models match the day's readings. Tidal aliasing is eliminated by cross-referencing with NOAA tide gauges, which remain steady. Residual orbital errors, typically less than a centimeter, are dwarfed by the magnitude of the current signal. The team reprocesses the data with alternate algorithms, yet the anomaly persists. Every check against known error sources returns the same result. The uplift is real, according to the instruments, but unprecedented in the context of the archive. The credibility gap widens. For decades, California's vertical land motion has been a slow, measured process governed by tectonics and groundwater. The absence of any prior centimeter scale jumps in the record makes the present readings difficult to accept. Yet the evidence is there, plotted in color-coded lines that refuse to converge. The challenge to accepted theory is now quantified, displayed in side-by-side -side graphs that show the old world and the new, separated by a gulf no model can yet bridge. Long before satellites and GPS, the Pacific coast was shaped by forces that left their imprint in layers of earth and buried forests. On a cold winter night in January 1700, a massive earthquake ruptured the Cascadia subduction zone and sent shockwaves from Northern California to Vancouver Island. In the hours that followed, entire stretches of shoreline dropped suddenly, some by more than a meter, leaving coastal forests drowned by salt water and villages swept away by waves that crossed the Pacific. The event was later traced through tree rings, native oral histories, and sand layers deposited far inland, each clue a fragment of a disaster that unfolded in silence and darkness. Paleoseismologists have spent decades excavating tidal marshes and estuaries along the Northern California and Oregon coasts, searching for the marks of that upheaval. In the stratigraphy, abrupt changes tell the story. A band of dark, peaty soil once the floor of a thriving forest abruptly overlain by gray, sandy mud. These contacts are sharp, not gradual, capturing the moment the land dropped and the sea surged in. Radiocarbon dating fixes the timing to the winter of 1699 to 1700. Japanese records written by samurai officials describe an orphan tsunami arriving with no local quake its waves traced back to the American coast. The 1700 event stands as the clearest precedent for sudden, large-scale changes along the Pacific margin, but its signature was subsidence, not uplift. Where the land moved, it moved down. The lesson, carved into the buried forests and drowned marshes, is that coastlines can change, not just over centuries, but in a single night. For scientists and planners, the Cascadia record remains a caution. The ground itself can betray expectations, and the past is written in layers that warn of risks beyond the boundaries of modern measurement. Inspection teams fan out across the waterfront, notebooks in hand, as city engineers and USGS specialists converge on the hardest hit neighborhoods. Along a stretch of Ocean Avenue, a two-story home stands lopsided, its concrete porch split by a jagged crack nearly four centimeters wide. Surveyors kneel beside the foundation, measuring the offset with a steel ruler, while the homeowner, face drawn, recounts hearing a sharp pop the night before. At the municipal marina, dock pilings now sit askew, 
their tops no longer level with the wharf. Harbor officials log a vertical misalignment of 17 centimeters since the previous inspection, enough to disrupt loading ramps and force the closure of two berths. Sewer maintenance crews report manhole covers that no longer sit flush with the pavement. In some blocks, pipes have shifted out of grade, complicating drainage and raising the risk of backups. Each site is tagged with GPS coordinates and time-stamped photos, feeding a growing database of structural anomalies. The numbers tell a story of stress. Concrete slabs buckled by several centimeters, steel supports warped, and benchmark pins sheared out of alignment. For city planners and insurers, these readings translate directly into mounting repair costs and urgent questions about the stability of the ground beneath their feet. Developers along the California coast received urgent advisories as city planning offices froze permit applications for new waterfront projects. By late afternoon, at least six major real estate firms paused construction on high-value sites in Pacifica, Santa Cruz, and Ventura, citing uncertainty over ground stability. Notices went out to contractors. All foundation work within designated risk corridors was suspended pending geotechnical review. Insurance carriers reacted just as quickly. Two of the largest property insurers, holding billions in coastal assets, issued revised risk maps to their underwriters. Premiums for existing policies in the affected zones were raised by up to 40% and new coverage applications faced immediate denial or required special geological assessments. Mortgage lenders flagged properties within uplift corridors for reassessment, triggering a wave of calls from homeowners worried about loan terms and resale value. Local governments convened emergency sessions, debating temporary moratoriums on coastal development while demanding technical briefings from the United States Geological Survey and state geologists. Lawmakers drafted preliminary resolutions calling for federal disaster funds and independent audits of seismic monitoring data. The economic ripple spread through the region as stalled projects and rising insurance costs threatened to slow the coastal real estate market. Each institutional move added pressure on scientific teams to explain the ongoing anomaly, even as the data hinted at deeper geophysical changes still out of reach. Seismic tomography results arrive in the early evening, lighting up the monitors in Menlo Park with an image unlike anything in the archive. The velocity inversion model, built from hours of synchronized offshore and onshore data, reveals a broad, low-velocity reservoir stretching beneath the coastline from just north of Santa Cruz to the approaches of Half Moon Bay. At depths of 12 to 16 kilometers, the cross-sections show a diffuse zone where seismic waves slow dramatically, an anomaly that cuts across the grain of the region's familiar geology. The boundaries of this reservoir curve upward toward the surface, its geometry resembling a shallow, elongated dome, rather than the deep planar faults mapped in decades past. Analysts trace the inflation trend through time-lapse overlays. Over the previous month, the reservoir's upper margin has crept upward by as much as two kilometers, displacing overlying layers in a pattern that matches the uplift corridor recorded by the GPS array. No known tectonic process accounts for this scale of rapid inflation without triggering significant earthquakes. The model's color gradients, deep blue for fast, red for slow, make the chamber's presence unmistakable. The anomaly is not just a set of numbers. It is a shape a volume, a reservoir of change pushing the coastline upward, defying the logic of every previous survey. The question of what lies beneath is no longer academic. It is a living, growing reality that demands explanation. Today, rumor can outpace reality, especially when science moves carefully and facts take time to surface. California's coast isn't rising overnight, but the flood of misinformation is. As climate anxiety grows, separating data from drama matters more than ever. The real danger is not what the land does, but what we choose to believe. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below.